everybody. Welcome to the Teen Tea Podcast. Who's it by Teen Bruno and Tony Verga? 77 and sunny. <laughs> Please find us on YouTube and like and subscribe to our videos. Now, how would they find us on YouTube? Just go to TNT Podcast? I think if they're going to um, Google or search for any of our guests, they could find us. Or if they want to look for fantastic podcast hosts, they could find us. So TNT Podcast. Yes, That's absolutely. It. Okay, because I, I might give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so today we've got uh, Glenn Evans. He's going to be coming to the studio. He is an adventure cinematographer. Mm. So I want to ask you, Tony, um, have you been on any adventures that you feel that has changed you emotionally? Or, mm. or has it been like a great physical experience? Well, you know, when I was at Ripley's um, down in Tampa, this guy, this guy was a dive captain, and he used to get a dead mackerel and put it in his <laughs> mouth. And the barracuda would line up and see it, and it was feeding time, and they would come and take it out of his mouth. And that was like, what the hell is this guy doing? (laughs) You know, so I I like water. And and after that, I became, I certified myself. I went and I started to dive. I I haven't done that in a while, but the peacefulness of being underwater was really weird. I, I got um, certified down outside of Cancun. Well, that's impressive. Yes. And it was great. It's not, I don't think it's difficult. Right. But I remember the first day they had me out there. I'm, I'm diving. A retired dentist from Houston had this dive place down there. And uh, he takes me out with Jose. Jose says, come on, man, we'll go diving right now. I said, I'm new at this. I, you know, he goes, no, no, we're good. And I remember swimming underwater. It's only maybe 50 feet and I'm swimming and I see a beautiful school of tropical fish come by and they all start shitting at the same time (laughs) and they land on the ground and I'm like, that's, that's that's all fish. (laughs) Yeah. So, I mean, underwater really is, um, it's a great escape. I haven't done it since I was in Maui, but I really enjoyed it. So I think that kind of, made me realize there's a lot underwater. Right. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, like, I know, I know. It, 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 it's like I'm not a beach guy and I'm not doing it all the time, but maybe when I retire, I would get a little bit more into it because I really like being underwater. Right. With a tank. Yeah. How about you? You've done, you've done a lot of stuff. You know, I think the biggest thing I did that was adventurous for me was I was – in a relationship for four years with the same person. I was living with this guy right after college. And then I got a chance to go to France to work on a sitcom where I would just have to pick up my stuff and go for a year. Mm -hmm. And it was a big deal. So I went over to France and it really changed my life because I realized how much of my life I'd closed off by staying with him. Mm. And he did not want to go to France. I said, do you want to come visit me? He's like, no, I've already been to France. Why do I need to go? Uh, And I was like, no. And when you go over there, life is completely different. When you go to France, you are, it is required by law for them to have a bottle of wine on every table. Yes. Good law, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) And they're just like, you know, every day you got to, you know, I'm not that friendly, but every day I got to come in. I got to kiss everybody. You got to kiss them on the cheek. That must have been very uncomfortable. for By you. the end of the season, I was going through the back so I could avoid yeah, yeah. all the kisses. But after lunch, everybody's drunk. A day, a shoot day would take 12, 14 hours because they're all like Hammered. drunk. Yeah. The director's on coke. But it was pretty amazing. Ah, the French. <laughs> Steve Martin used to have a great line when he did stand up. Do you remember Steve Martin's stand up? Of course. He goes, you I know, was those, go see him. those French, they have a different word for everything. Yeah. <laughs> there, was, there was one more shoot I did, and it was just a throwaway shoot. When the Olympics were going on, a friend of mine worked at Ellen, and they wanted me to take a big Ellen cutout, mm-hmm. a big cardboard cutout, and take her take the, uh, her take the cutout to Park City, Utah. Right. And put this cutout of Ellen on the luge, on the um on the two man bobsled, on the four man bobsled, and on the skeleton, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they wanted me to shoot it with her on it so she could say, Well, I'm not there, but but I'm there and you know, my heart and soul's with you and 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 check me out on the slopes, yeah. right? It was a, a yeah, gag. Yeah, that's funny. So after we did all that, the guy who had the two man the four man bobsled says, Hey, you wanna go down the on the bobsled with me? I go, Me? Oh my god. He goes, Yeah, just we'll give you a helmet and do it. And I remember the woman 
she was really sweet. The woman who worked for the for the uh, ski resort. I said, I don't think I'm going to do it. She pulls me aside. She goes, Tony, when's the next time you're going to have a chance to go down on a four man bobsled? Yeah, absolutely. And not pay you for do it. it. Yeah, you got to do she it. She goes, you got to do it. You got to do it. So this guy, he drove. We got another guy in the back and me. So it was three guys in a four man bobsled. He goes, just put your arms here and just go with it. I said, okay, this is going to be great. Well, let me tell you something. You're hitting, like you're pulling G's as you're doing this going down. Yeah. When I got out, I was sweating. I took that helmet off oh and it was God. like, I, it was like taking a fishbowl off my head. <laughs> I was sweating. My arms were killing me from hitting side <laughs> to side. Were you this big at the time? I was a little smaller. I was pro no, I was a lot smaller. I was like I was like 30 pounds, 40 right. pounds lighter. So I fit in the bobsled. <laughs> but I gotta tell you, my neck from doing this, from hitting all the G's, right. I couldn't my neck was a mess for like a month. Like when you watch it, it looks easy. And then when oh, you do it, no, it's like crazy. No, If you take an, well, let's see, uh, this is probably 10 years ago. So if you take a 50 year old out of shape guy and put him in a bobsled and yeah. go down, yeah. he will be feeling it for a month afterwards. Oh, yeah, it was, it was tough. And that was life changing, yeah. but life changing, like, wow, I'm glad I'm not a bobsled. Yeah. You know, but you got to take, I always say, if the chance comes, take it because yes. it's not going to come again. And that's what I always teach my kids. If it comes, you got to take it. I don't care what it is because you don't know and you got to experience it. You never want to look back on your life and say, I should have. I didn't do that. I was scared. Don't let fear stop you from taking that fun opportunity. Well, there was times when I didn't take the fun opportunity. We had a, I had to interview a, um, a Navy vet who was a double amputee who, sky who was a skydiver. Mm -hmm. And we went down to um, Lake Elsinore. Well, that's where I learned to skydive. Right. You, you skydive? Yeah. Well, I only did it the one time. But yeah, after that, I, I was like, it. I don't and need And do we did some shooting with him. We were up in the plane, him jumping out, then right. on, on uh -huh. the ground, shooting him landing, and a long interview. And he's like, you want to go? I'm like, absolutely <laughs> not. Like, I, I'm petrified of heights, so I right. wouldn't do that. But um, It doesn't feel like any. You just jump out, and it goes so fast and your face is completely peeled back the wind is hitting you and i swear the ground just comes so fast at you yeah that's not anything i would want to do for a million dollars literally i wouldn't really? yeah i have a um when i was at ripley's I, I ripley's was fun <laughs> i had to interview the guy who free climbed the empire state building and changed the light bulb oh my god okay his name was tom stilliman mm -hmm. i still keep in touch with him and i have the light bulb the old light bulb. Oh my it's gosh, about it's this fantastic. big. So he said, Why don't you come on? He was like, Talk like this, right? Like a guy who climbs the Empire right. State Building right. would sound. He's like, Hey, why don't you uh, come on up with me? I'm like, Absolutely not. But he did let me get to the point where you could open the hatch right. and start climbing. As soon as I opened the hatch and stuck my head out, yeah. I felt my testicles <laughs> suck right up into my body. I had a visceral feeling of being petrified and afraid. Right. And I said to him, something's going on. He goes, yeah, I know. You're afraid of heights. <laughs> I said, I am petrified. And I was safe. Right. Like it was fenced in, right? Yeah. So I was like 20 stories above the observation deck. It's, it's just a little hatch you open up and you walk out and you start free climbing, but you're surrounded by fence. You can't fall. Yeah. But just knowing that I'm higher than the observation deck and you're higher than some clouds. Right. That was enough for me. I mean, I'm not kidding you. I, my body, my, my <laughs> testicles shrunk and they were in my throat by the time I was done. I, I couldn't do it. And for a million dollars, I couldn't, I couldn't jump out of a plane. I don't know what I'm scared of doing. The there are things I don't like to do, like which are just silly, but I would not go hiking. <laughs> you would hike? Only because nothing good happens on a hike. Nothing. Every time you hear a news story about a hiker, he's got to cut off his leg. He's frozen. He's taken off all of his clothes and he's run out. Yeah, nothing good happens. There are two things. Nothing good happens in space. 
and nothing good happens on a hike. I mean, I'll do it if I have to, but I'm like, you know what? These people who go out there and they don't tell anybody where they're going and then they get lost. Yeah, that's get, a little weird. That's ridiculous. Well, they're always saving that. two hikers Yeah, from they're somewhere. always, I'm like, you know what? It's your own fault. Why and they're I experienced need to hikers. Yeah. yeah, really? I don't well, need to come get well, you. Why are we looking at you if you're experienced? Right. Yeah. You just climbed Mount Everest. I don't need to get you. You know the risk right. going up there. Well, I tell you, I would hike before I would um, jump out of a plane. With a parachute. Yeah, I would do that. Because of your fear of heights. I can't. Yeah, I, that's a visceral fear. I remember I was in New Zealand for another production. It wasn't exciting or anything. And I went up to that. They have like a space needle in, in New Zealand. It's a right. casino. Mm -hmm. And they have a glass floor at on the oh. top. It's about as big as this table. Right. Yeah, and they nice. have pictures of all the presidents standing yeah. on it. Yeah. And I remember just looking down going, what the, Why? You know, I got married, Why would you married want to in do New that? Zealand. Huh? I got married the first time in New Zealand. What do you mean the first time? The first time I got married, I've been married three times. Oh, wait. <laughs> Hold on. Stop. You've been married three, three times. Three times, right, right. I've been married- To three different people? Yes. Yes. How do I- <laughs> Not know How this. How do I not know this? <laughs> Why would I bring it? When I went to France, let's go back. When I went to France and I was there and I had just left my boyfriend of four years and I was like, man, I should stay in France. I started dating this jazz musician who's a saxophonist, right? Because that's like, I went from super, somebody super rigid and stiff to somebody like, hey, I'm a free form jazz saxophonist. And he goes, okay, let's get married. And I'm like, what? How long were you dating? Uh, I don't know, a couple of months, six, maybe, maybe three months, something like that. He goes, let's get married so you can stay in France and work. Right. And then he goes, but I got to tell my mother because I'm in my forties. He was in his forties and I've never been married. So he tells his mother who lives in New Zealand. Cause he's from half New Zealand, half French. And she's like, well, I got to have a wedding. I cannot go through my life and not have a wedding. So he goes, we got to go to New Zealand. We get to New Zealand. It becomes a thing where I got a dress. And then I thought to myself, Oh my God, I do not want to be married to a jazz saxophonist in France because suddenly he went from, hey, you're going to live in France to, I wouldn't mind going to America. And I'm like, no, no, that is not happening. So I got married in New Zealand. He had to go back to France. I went back to America. I saw him. I flew out to France to see him one more time. And then I'm like, I need a divorce. So I did all the paperwork and filed the paperwork to get a divorce after a couple, maybe another six months. He would not sign the papers. Um, but after six months, if he doesn't sign the papers, it automatically goes into a default divorce. So I divorced him. And so that, I never, right, I've been married, let me tell you this. Right. I've been married three times. I've lived with one husband who I've been with that I married on from Craigslist on a reality show. All right, tell me about the second marriage. The second marriage was... My father, <laughs> so after I married that guy, my dad says, hey, you got to do me a favor. I said, what? He goes, there's this kid and he wants to get married to stay in the country. Why don't you marry him? Because then he'll give me some money. My dad is a bit of a shyster. He'll do anything for money. He's always got a deal. Hey, you know, I, I don't want to marry a guy for money. But my dad's like, come on, you got to do it. You got to do it for me. I need the money. I need the money. I need the money. I said, fine, I will do it. I said, it's going to cost him $30,000. He'll give you 10000 and then I get the rest. And then, uh, so we made the deal. Uh, but I got, actually, they negotiated down to like $28,000, and I gave my dad five. And I was able to pay off my student loans. But I knew how to do it. Yeah, One yeah. thing that's good about me is I know how to do paperwork. Yeah, yeah. Right? That's like my yeah. strong point. Great. And I watched the movie Green Card. Oh, <laughs> he was a nice guy. Yes, yeah, yeah. Sure, Dupardieu. Right. So um, he was a nice kid. Dupardieu. He was only like 22 at the time. He was Vietnamese. Okay. Sweet kid. He wants to be in America to become a doctor. Oh, right. So come on. You did, a, you did a service. I did a service. So I married him. I filed all the paperwork. I transferred all of my information oh, over right. to his house. And then um, did you guys to live photos. together? No. We never lived together, but I transferred all of my information to his house. So it appeared like we lived there. I would go to his house once a week to pick up the mail. And then I knew from the movie that when you go in for the meeting, they're watching you before the guy walks into the room. So as soon as you go into the building, they're watching you the whole time. Right. 
So that's super affectionate, holding hands, you know, right. on his shoulder. And then they call you into the room and they don't come into the room for 15 minutes. So, so they, in the right. Out, right. So I'm super affectionate. Well, he's giving me a massage. So the guy walks into the room. He looks at us and just stamps, stamps the card. Bam, bam. Okay, you're all done. And the kid was like, what happened? I go, they're watching us. And as we walk out, I saw people crying. Right. The guy was harassing them. And we also took photos, like wedding photos, right. fake wedding photos where I dressed up right. and then That's pictures cool. with the family. <laughs> wow. And then wow. in order to get permanent residency, so that gives you like a five-year green card. But to get permanent residency, you either have to have a baby or have a house together. So I bought a house. In Michigan? No, here in California. Okay. It was my very first house. I bought a house and I put his name on it. Okay. I sent in the paperwork. And then I took his name off. <laughs> okay. And then now he's a citizen. Is he a doctor? He's a doctor. He's a dentist. He's a well, dentist. you should be getting free dental at yeah, least. I for know, the rest but of he's you. in the Midwest somewhere. He's super happy. He's still like really nice to my father. We'll call my father once right. in a while. Do and, you guys celebrate your anniversary? No, no, no. But I paid off my student loans from that. Wow. Yeah. Teen, I've never been married. I've never <laughs> jumped out of a plane. Wow, that's that's odd. I've had a lot of adventures. All right, so coming up next, we are going to meet Glenn Evans. He's a producer and two-time Emmy-nominated director of photography who specializes in adventure cinematography and environmental productions. So he learned underwater videography at the Brooks Institute, and we're going to ask him about that. And uh, I know that Glenn's shot um, in 58 countries around the world. Some of his credits include Whale Wars, Edge of Alaska, and like 27 other productions. So we are lucky to have him here today because uh, he's about to hit the road to start season four of Ocean Treks with Jeff Corwin for ABC. So let's hear from Glenn next. <laughs> All right, so I'd like everyone to welcome Glenn Evans. Like Glenn. I said, he's an adventure cinematographer. Glenn, nice to have you. Hey, thanks for having me. Cameraman, adventure cinematographer. What do you like, Glenn? Uh, you know, I Tell love your I love adventure cinematographer. That sounds wonderful. That's yeah. a wow. Glenn, Glenn a have fancy. you seen Free Solo? Yes, I have. Okay, I have. so I want to know, in Free Soul, they talk about the fact that he has a, a hormonal issue or some sort of uh, biological issue where he is unable to feel fear at the same level as other people, and so he needs that in order to survive. Do you have that same issue? Absolutely not. I don't have any of that. I'm scared <laughs> all the time. All really? the time. But do you look forward to it? Yes, I do. I, I, I do have the I look forward to gene. But uh, the, the I don't feel – well, I don't know. You know, things that make – that scare me are like I have to sit on an airplane with uh, a bunch of people and I have to watch everyone like try to load stuff into the above <laughs> compartments and right. it's too big. Right. I, or, or like being trapped in an elevator with nine people and having to get really hot, you know. That's what scares <laughs> me. I'm not scared of animals or, uh, or big rocks or I, – I mean, I think everybody to degree has a, a fear of heights, but uh, – I don't know. I like being out in the open. I like working with animals and ancient architecture and exotic locations. And so, you know, I watch Free Solo. <clears throat> I'm a. I can't deal with heights at all. <laughs> Even though I knew the guy survived, and he's, he, I could not watch some of the shots. And I, you know, I've been in the field. I, you know, I'm segment director. Tina and I shoot stuff. I worked for Ripley's. I shot a lot of cool stuff. I the height thing killed me, and I'm thinking. These guys who are shooting this, you know they're tethered in. You know they're right. – you could do that. You could go up on a mountain, hang off a mountain with a carabiner and a strap, that, and that doesn't bother you? Well, I mean, it, you have to keep reminding yourself that you've got at least three fail-safes. I have a quick story. I was um, working for Discovery Channel in conjunction with the BBC, and they didn't even tell me what I had to do. And we had like a big dinner and of course a bunch of wine before, so I was a little bit hungover. And then I get to the, we were in the Redwoods, or no, I'm sorry, Sequoia, and then they said, okay, Glenn, you're going to learn really quickly how to climb this giant tree. It's the eighth largest tree oh in the world. Gosh. It's called the Genesis tree, uh, or seventh largest. And it takes like 30 people to hold your hands in a circle to get around this tree, and the thing is almost 1,000 feet tall. They fire a crossbow and put this big line up, and then they had to teach me in like 10 minutes how to use an, um, uh, a rig that you 
kind of hook onto your belt. It's a, called an extender rig. And you right. like climb all the way up with the camera on my shoulder. And I was hung over. I'm like, you could have given me some preparation for this. It's like, I ha- this is what I have to do. And they're like, the permit ends the next day. We have to do it now. We have to do it now. <laughs> it's and, always money. Yeah. And so I'm on this branch and uh, uh, the, there's a lot of slack in the line. And they want me to walk out on the branch. Because I was filming these scientists gathering a fungus that only grows on these trees at this height. So they're trying to see if it has any medicinal use, and they were talking about sustainability and everything. So I'm like, okay, I know I'm okay. If I fall off the branch, it's going to be fine. But it literally had no tension. Like I couldn't like sit and have some confidence with this tense, tense line. So it was just like walking out on a branch like 900 feet up with a camera on my shoulder trying to film these scientists gather this moss, and I just kept having to remind myself, I'm tethered in, I'm tethered in, I'm tethered in, I'm tethered in. And so it was like, I think I can, I think I can. And then you just take one small step at a time. And then before you know it, it's over. Once you start shooting, do you forget the danger or the situation that you're in because you're focused on getting the shot? It's true. Well, and you tend to, that's the distraction there. Yes. Is the shot, what you just said. Uh, because there are a lot of scary things that you think about doing, whether it's working with a wild animal or climbing somewhere high. You just have to distract yourself with the job. You've shot, I was looking at some of the stuff that you've shot in foreign countries. Have you ever been charged by, by anything? You must have been charged. Like an animal? You yeah, mean? like an animal. I have. I have indeed. The most common animal that I've been charged by is a rhino. And well, more that, than once. Listen to what you just said. The most common <laughs> animal I've been charged by is a rhino. Who in a 500 mile radius is going to come on? Well, and I'll tell you, there's tricks too. Okay. You, you learn tricks. I mean, I was working with Jeff Corwin. He's an animal host and a preservationist. And uh, I work with him now, actually. But we were doing a show about preservation and endangered animals for NBC. It was like a. Uh, once an animal reaches a hundred or numbers a hundred, there's probably a high probability that animal is going to be extinct. Right. So they called it a hundred heartbeats because that's what was left. And once that number is reached for a species, you can pretty much, you know, it's very d- difficult to bring it back. But we were darting the rhinos uh, in Kenya in Lake Nakuru. And, uh, and what do you, you mean darting? Well, so you fly in a helicopter with the Kenyan Wildlife Service, the KWS. They're the ones that basically run the show. They're like the park rangers of all these big parks. And you find um, various kinds of rhinos, black rhinos, white rhinos, whatever you're looking for uh, in an area of drought. Now, drought doesn't necessarily mean no water. It can mean no food as well. So we're in the helicopter. They have to hit the rhino with the dart. Um, in a specific spot, and they can only give it a specific dose because the nervous system of a rhino is really sensitive. So when you get on the ground with that rhino, it's kind of like it's had a couple cocktails, but uh, you got to bring it down. So uh, and then they tag it and do blood samples, and and so these guys use their jackets. The the the, the Kenyan Wildlife Service, they all of a sudden they start to all taking off their jackets and going towards the rhino with their jackets open to throw it over its face so it can't see because they're going to push it over on its side. And then once this kind of half-drunk rhino is on its side, that's when they do the tests. And then when they have it, they try to line up a big metal box and push the rhino into the box as they give it a reverse serum so it just sort of freaks out and then it goes into the box and they shut the door. You'd think they... there'd be a better way. <laughs> <laughs> That's how they do that. But, but if the jacket misses and you're on the ground, that rhino just starts looking around and it will come straight at you. And what you have to do is run in a circle because the rhino is so heavy. Um, it takes a lot for it to turn. So it'll, it'll go full bore at you and then you have to watch it. And then you have to just run to the left or right I usually go to the right and they, and you make a big circle. So it kind of widens out its path because it's so big while you're small and you can run in a small yeah. circle. Team, so gravity. Next time a rhino's charging us yeah. when we're out in the field, <laughs> you run right, I'll run left. That's a great tip. But does that work for the other animals as well? Elephants? And... Oh, no. A lot of animals you're not supposed to run from because then you look like prey, like a Correct. bear. I think alligators, you're supposed to go left and right because they <laughs> could run fast straight, but they can't cut. No, but like mountain lions, you're supposed to stand up and be as big as possible. And same with bears, correct? That's it. Yeah. You don't run away from those guys because then you look like a, a food. By the way, so you got to be loud known, and big. Little known fact, darting rhinos was the high school band I was in <laughs> back in the 70s. Oh, I got a funny story about crocodiles and alligators. You have to look where their tail is curved. Because if you stand on the side where their tail is bent out, 
uh, they can hit you with your their yeah, tail. They can you whack have to you. you have to see the side that the the tail is and just go to that side so they don't have that. Yeah, this is fantastic. I, 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 I want to move to Florida, and I'm trying to talk my girlfriend <laughs> into coming with me. You know, yeah. we've been together 19 years. She's like, I don't think I can I can't live with alligators. And I said, I'm totally with you, but we could we could learn how to. We don't have to live in the swamp. We don't have to move to Okefenokee. We could we could live in Tampa. And I'm reading up about alligators, and you know they don't really kill you unless you mess with them or unless they're hungry. And of course, my girlfriend's Japanese. They killed a Japanese girl in Hilton, oh and she's God. like, Tony, uh, once they taste Japanese food. <laughs> I am not moving. I'm not moving to any place where there's. So I'll tell her. I'll say, you know, we could just stay away from the tail. We'll be fine. Hey, you do a lot of underwater stuff. Yeah. Did you know a West Skiles? I do not know West Skiles. He, no. He, he's he was a cameraman. I used at Ripley's. Okay. Underwater guy. He he passed. Be, caving. Very oh, dangerous. People yeah. don't get how dangerous it is underwater. Did did you like shooting underwater? I I love being underwater. And I'm not, I don't do it a lot, but it was very peaceful. Did you love it or would you rather be, you know, darting rhinos? Well, I'll tell you, underwater is, um, you know, a lot of times it's it's a tough thing because it's kind of a niche market. We, we talked a little bit early about right. that. Uh, and a lot of times you have to make these shots for the show that you're on with the schedule that they've provided. So right. it becomes, so now... Of course, I'd love to shoot underwater if the water was great, there was high visibility, the animals were plentiful, there was a, but a lot of times because of the schedule and when you need to fly in and out and how much time you have to not be uh, underwater before you fly on a plane, right? you can't just dive and then fly on an airplane. You have oh, to I wait because you're going to absorb nitrogen, especially if you're below 33 feet, you start absorbing nitrogen in your bloodstream. You you could get bent if you got in an airplane, which means nitrogen starts to expand it, in your bloodstream. It's not practical then. Yeah. You, so, you, so a lot of times... Uh, well, production you, wouldn't know that, and so they would schedule you so tight. That's the thing. So you have to let them know because not everybody knows about uh, what it takes to dive underwater. And a lot of times you have to make these shots when the when the, uh, the the situation for the ocean is not good, like there's lots of surge and it's a storm and the visibility is bad or there's jellyfish right. or you can't. Um, I mean, I don't know how many times I've tried to come up to tell the producers that it's not nice under here and we need to pro do it. The, the foot just comes onto my dive mask. <laughs> well, you need to film this because we it's going to cost us money to stay an yes. extra day. Yes. So I don't like being put in that situation because – I've been hurt a couple times because of that. I've had hypothermia. I've almost been bent. Um, uh, means I've been down too deep too long. Right. Uh, I've had. I've almost been swept away in a giant current. You know, I've ran out of air plenty of times. So there's a lot of that to manage, and that can really get to you. You know, is being underwater the most difficult thing that you had to do as a cinematographer? I I would say one of the most difficult times, uh, only when I've ever gotten in trouble. Like I had this instance where I was in New Zealand diving with uh, this great native tribe, the Maoris, and they're allowed to collect fresh water uh, like shrimp on the bottom of this volcanic lake. So it's this extinct volcano, but it goes down forever. And uh, I'm like, okay, guys, listen, when we go down there, I have the camera. So the show that we're making is right here. If you all take off and I don't see what you're doing, <laughs> there's no show. Right. But of course, 95% of everybody is so excited and they want to get going. They think just magically I can be where they are making stuff happen. And it's just not the truth. So of course we get to the bottom and we're very deep. Everyone just takes off. Oh, no. I'm like, guys, so and there, you can't talk under there. You can't. I mean, now you can. You, you can, can do, do a lot of buddy. this, though. Yeah, but if they're not looking at you, it's like, where are you going? So of course, I try to kick after everybody. And I'm using more oxygen, and I'm trying to get in front of everyone. I like to get the subject in the water between the lens, uh, like if it's a fish or an animal. I like to get the animal between me and let's say the host gotcha. oh, yes, so I you see. can see right. the reaction of the person and yet that animal is there in front of of them and you so it's a nice way to get things done quickly in a big shot because was, was the shrimp delicious they were amazing yeah and they'd cook them in this um geothermic pool they'd put them in a uh. cheesecloth bag and put them in there and then everyone would eat them so that was the segment but my god all of a sudden i realized 
how long have we been down here? And of course, all my dive gear is metric and I'm very American. So I, it takes me a while to do the math, you know? Yeah. And so I brought another dive computer that was English, you know, or basically American. And I could look and see that we'd been at like 120 feet for like, you know, 35, 40 minutes, which is a lot. You're absorbing a lot of nitrogen um, or something like that. Anyway, it was, it was very bad. And as soon as I grabbed the the person that was leading the dive, they turned and looked and I'd been kicking and using more air because I'm trying to get these shots while they're just kind of hanging out on the bottom. So they're like, we got to go up. So we go up and of course I run out of air at my decompression stop. And, and then, uh, you know, that makes me a little bit nervous. And then I had to reach for somebody else's air, you know, and I got a hold of it. It was a little bit of panic and I had to still be down there for another uh, 15 minutes for a decompression yeah, yeah, stop. And so I was just kind of like this underwater things, you know, one time I was in Alaska under the ice and I was waiting for everybody to come in and there was a malfunction and I was down there for 20 minutes not moving and I got hypothermic and they brought me up and I got the shakes and I had to hold on to a, they took all my clothes off and I had to hold on to a plastic bowl for full of boiling water in the ice. So Tane, we're not like shooting up. underwater. No, no. If this show goes on the road, <laughs> we are not shooting you underwater. Know, but I love the great tip of trying to get the fish and then the subject because I would think you'd want the wide shot with one person on one side and the fish on the other side. But I love that. If you're in a hurry. Action. It's a good way to get it done. Were the Maori diving without any equipment? No, no. They had all full dive gear, but for some oh, reason, they, I don't know, they were just doing their thing. It wasn't until I, I alarmed them. I mean, you know, cause we were making great stuff. As soon as I caught up with everybody and told them to mellow out and like, be like, listen, here's a shrimp crawling on the ground. I've got it. Why don't you come over and get it? And so they'd come and grab it and then look at it and put it in their bag and swim on, out of frame, you know? So I have to make like a sequence of those shots, yeah. you know? So it, it takes a lot of work, especially people aren't familiar with what we're doing. And so the frustration is you could be down there a long time too deep. And then before you know it, you're not those guys who sh like go right up to the sharks and mess with them and hold on to their fin and no, not or me. go in the cage or one of those things. You're not that guy. No, not me. I don't do that. Good. I, I have been in shark cages before. Um, typically now shark cages are, uh, they have the ones that obviously float in the water that you swim out to and get in, right. but a lot of insurance, you know, it takes a lot of, you know, it all comes down to money a lot of times. So now they've got these cages that just hook onto the side of the boat, like right. a pocket protector. And then you just get into the, right. into the cage on the side of the boat and you film it. But if it's kind of stormy or there's like a lot of surge in the water, the boat will move side to side and then your cage is moving side to side. So your shots cannot be very good if it's yeah. not still. So a lot of times now uh, the pole cam is the best way because that boat can be rocking back and forth. But if you have that pole in the water, you can hold it steady and they can take a piece of tuna. And another thing we're not and, doing. That's, fantastic. We're not so doing that's another shark. way to get your underwater shots if the, if the situation is bad. So you've been to about 58 different countries. Yes. How often are you away from home? How many weeks at a time? Well, I think the longest I've been gone was four months. I did a show called Whale Wars on Animal Planet. It was all about preservation of animals and the ice in the Antarctic. Um, and that was four months long. I actually left, let's see, 2010 Thanksgiving Day. I got back in uh, late March of 2011. How and that long, was hard. How long are your shoots primarily? Typically about three weeks. You go out for about three weeks. You come back for... Mm, 10 days to two weeks and then you go out again and you do that until the episodes are fulfilled. You and know? you're married? Yeah, I'm married. Do you married. have kids? No, not yet. And what is it? I just got married two years ago too. And what does she say? She doesn't mind except for when it bothers her. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. <laughs> yeah. Uh, tomorrow's our two year anniversary, but I actually met her on the road. She's from Brazil and I was making a show about people that hunt for classic cars in the most dangerous areas of Central and South America and have to get it across the border, you know. So it was kind of like this, a dangerous in a different way with gangs and money because we had to pay cash and everything. So her family restores classic cars in Brazil and that's where I met her. So do you guys plan to have kids? Yeah, we do. Do you? <laughs> that's going to be, I want to hear you back when that happens. Did you, shoot that, did you shoot that classic car show in Cuba? Did you, did you shoot no, that No, but I, lo I love that show. Yeah. No, I, I did not. I didn't have any part of that. Um, you know, I I had spent a lot of time. I spent about four years in Alaska making a show called Edge of Alaska for Discovery. And then 
my gosh, you know, you do one thing, it leads to another. Mm -hmm. I did this crazy documentary about people escaping the Ku Klux Klan. Mm -hmm. So I spent months in the South with the Klan, tremendous access with this, you know, group of people that have uh, their ideas, I guess. And then uh, uh, I spent some time in the South working with cowboys. And that is where I got hit by, ran over by a, a really angry cow. Yeah, cows get angry oh, they sometimes. Get, <laughs> yeah, they get mad. If you watch Dr. Paul, oh. he, cows are not, the, you can't just pet them all the time. Sometimes no. they're ornery. And they're charging at you? Yeah, because these cows were born in the wild in a piece of woods. Like if you have a big like group of cattle, like 200 head of cattle, some of them sneak off and have babies and you don't know about it. <sighs> and then they grow up to be these big cows that aren't handled by people. And then you get in there and they will come running at you. Uh, and, and the thing, I'll tell you what, I know that when I'm working with a lion or a rhino or something like that, yeah, that's dangerous. So your danger alert is on. But with a cow, you're kind of like, well, it's going to stop. It's not going to, it's going to be your guard, you get your guard down. And then all of a sudden, the thing is running at you and you're like, stand your ground, stand your ground. And then, bop. Yeah. Did you get hit? I got hit. Oh my God. Oh, I got hit hard. Did you break anything I had a hematoma there? on my leg and it, oh. it kicked my uh, inside of my leg and stomped on me. But I think she was just trying to get away from me because, you know, a lot of times, cows or bulls once you're on the ground they'll come around and try to stomp on you again or do something again but this was just a one hit uh she just smacked ran me over and then took off see i don't feel bad eating them now yeah <laughs> they're delicious it's true yeah, they are delicious was that tell me was that the time that you've gotten hurt the most or was there more yeah i would say that was one of the times where i was hurt the most um uh i had a really crazy accident though it wasn't it was a group of us actually uh, on that show, Whale Wars, back to that, we were f- fighting off the Japanese whaling vessels uh, from harvesting whales. They were trying; they were in the Antarctic Marine Sanctuary, that is where animals go to rest. They're not; it's a worldwide known law that you cannot whale in these parts of the the seas it's of this, like the this Miami planet. Beach for whales. <laughs> yeah, they don't want to be bothered, right? Especially by a harpoon. So. Right. This comp- this um, organization called Sea Shepherd, I was there filming them. And long story short, they had a very new whaling vessel tailing our older boat. It was faster than us, so we couldn't get off their radar. And the only way to get it off their our radar for us to be invisible again so we can find that harvest vessel that uh, basically harvests all the whales um, to stop the whaling, we have to prop foul this vessel that's tailing us. What does that mean? That means you get in these small boats and the sea shepherds would load these ropes full of metal and uh, all kinds of crazy engine parts. And they would get in front of the whaling vessel and they would let the line out so it gets tied up in their propeller. So we were doing that. Mm -hmm. And that was a little bit dangerous because uh, we got a lot of rope and they were shooting fire hoses at us and throwing bamboo at us. And we were we wear like uh, wetsuits with a Kevlar suit over the top. Mm -hmm. But to make a long story short, we had we're in these inflatable French military grade rafts called rib boats. They find a prop fowler that didn't go into the propeller; it's floating on the o- the surface of the ocean. They pull it in, they get in front of the boat, they let it out, but they had tied it around the roll cage. There's a roll roll bar on the on our small inflatable inflatable boat, but it got tied into a knot, and now all of a sudden we're tied to this moving propeller, and we're getting dragged halfway underwater. Mm. So we finally cut it free, and then uh, we take off because we hear we're not on the radar anymore for this this uh, ship. But then our our floorboard from the pontoon of our vessel starts to tear, and we start to take on water. And that's when we had to spend the night in the Southern Ocean behind an iceberg with a tear in our raft oh and right. wait for our, our uh, ship to come get us. Again, we're not doing that <laughs> if we go on the road. Qu- question, <clears throat> everybody's... In love with all, you know, Earth, all these great yeah. 3D, not 3D, all these great aerial shots, aerial America, all these. That's different than what you do. A lot of these guys are there. They're dug in a bird cage for 12 hours getting the perfect shot yeah. when the birds mate, right, in full bloom at 3 o'clock in the morning. Right. That's different than what you do. Yeah. Those guys... They're they're dug in for a long time. That's it. To get one shot of a beaver making a dam or something, right? Did that ever was that ever interesting to you, or is that just a little boring for a guy who's more adrenaline? Well, I like that kind 
kind of photography because it tends to be better photography when you sit there and wait and you take your time. You know, I've noticed a difference between like what the BBC does and what a lot of American right. companies do. A lot of American companies will have a host and they want to make an hour long show in like 30 days. The BBC will have a narrator and they'll give you three to six months to make a one hour show where you're only filming like you described the animal doing its thing. And in the end, I think the time really pays off because it's a must, much nicer show if you look at all those great series they've made, Planet Earth, right. Frozen Planet, everything. That stuff takes years to photograph. Is that something you're interested in going into? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's kind of like the end all be all because those kinds of things get watched over and over and over again. And a lot of experts, doctors, scientists, people that appreciate that stuff, that's the stuff they look at and remember, you know. But um, the important thing for me is... I just, I'm an experience junkie. I just like to have that experience. Right. And it doesn't matter if we're going out for three weeks or three months. If I think it's important for me and I'm going to have a great time and I can lend my skills to whatever we're trying to make, then that's where I want to be. So, Did you feel like you fell into this specific position of adventure cinematography or did you set out to do it? Good question. I, I, I did not set out to do it. I, uh, you know, I started out as a as a PA, like everyone else, a production assistant and a getting coffee for producers. And then, um, you know, I was broke, so I needed to make a little more money. So I started getting involved with hanging lights and being an electrician on a lot of these older, crazy shows, you know. And then suddenly I got this opportunity because I had done underwater and I had a lot of spec commercials and other things underwater that had some merit that held some weight as a young young man, like 23, 24 years old, suddenly I find myself um, kind of creating and carving out a niche for myself. And then there was a TV show for Animal Planet called The Aquanauts back in 1998. And it only went one season, but that's where it started off because they asked me to go to these places and dive with these young, excited people about wildlife. And one thing led to another. And then producers leave from that show and get that kind of work. And then suddenly you find yourself doing exactly that kind of thing. How do you get yourself from where you are now to your goal of shooting the things that you want to shoot? Mm. Well, I think what you do is you just try to surround yourself with people that are doing the same thing. Mm. And I don't know, to anybody that would, was interested in doing this kind of work, I would recommend getting to know that camera first and getting to know exactly what it is that you're about to go do and be familiar with the system like get a job at a camera rental house or this or that. And you'll see those people that rent the cameras from those houses making the kinds of shows that you want to make. Oh, yes. And then you hit them up, you know, you're like, hey, so wow, we're, we're prepping this camera for you. So what do you do? What do you? And if you know the camera and they know you know the camera, there's a good chance if, they're, if somebody uh, can't make the show or can't do this, they'll bring you on as an assistant. And then it just starts from there, you know. Hey, you know, you've been to a lot of countries. How about the political unrest in these countries? Have you ever been worried about that? Like, oh yeah, you know that that I would imagine for me, I'd be a little bit more freaked out if guys with machine guns are walking around than if a bull is looking at me. No, that's a very good question too, and a good point. In fact, we were in one of the hotels in Sri Lanka last year that got blown up in this recent attack, right? And we saw that we saw where we ate breakfast. Uh, just a few months ago on the news, all, you know, in disarray and exploded and blown up. And um, it was, uh, you know, that's a big deal. People, for sure, when you work, you know, we avoid certain countries because of what's happening out there right now. One time, though, this was a while ago. This was back in 2001. But we were in Nepal. and uh, Or we were in Darjeeling, northern India, 30 kilometers from the border of Nepal. And we were in the square in Darjeeling. And this was right when the, this Indian prince had murdered his whole family, this royal family murder. It was like really scary. But so the town was already on edge and we were just there to film red pandas and stuff like that. So we were like, well, okay. So we were in this square trying to make these opening shots again with my friend, Jeff Corwin. And suddenly we're surrounded by these uh, angry people and they hang a picture of Mao Zedong on, on this stage kind of area and start talking about America and Israel and all this stuff. And it turned out they were um, Nepalese Maoist communists. 
The worst and, kind. And they were <laughs> <laughs> and they were very angry, so angry, they they laid strike to Darjeeling the next day. Wow. So everything was closed. And they decided to drive us instead of fly us to Nepal in these Jeeps at night. And so we had to get in these Jeeps and drive in these mountain roads at night, cross the border. And then we got flown in a small airplane to Kathmandu. And then we filmed rhinos in Chitwan, which I was charged again by a jungle rhino. And uh, we get back. And then the, the, the Nepalese communists are there in uh, Kathmandu. So they buy us a ticket to India early so we can just get out of there. But we didn't have another visa to get back into India, so they put us in a holding facility. Luckily, somebody recognized Jeff Kaur when he got out, and he bought us um, airplane tickets home through Amsterdam. And then, But then our gear didn't make it, so we had to wait in Amsterdam for like three days uh, for all of our equipment to arrive before we could head back to the States. So I, I hate when I'm in traffic on the 101. <laughs> See now that yeah. th- dude, you got a job every every cameraman, even <laughs> if they don't shoot that seriously. Right. If if you, you, most of the cameramen that I know, that we know that you have shot with in the past, they would sit here and listen to that, and they want it to be them. Although you know, like it, it's, it, it it's, might it's, be it sounds fun like one crazy, time. but it's awesome. It might be fun once in a while, but sometimes you get tired. Like, I mean, I gotta drag my equipment again, and now I gotta go up a freaking mountain. Yeah, but he was in Kathmandu. I understand, but does it get tiring? It it does. It does. I mean, it's part of it. You learn to manage that. The hardest part for me is um, sometimes my sleep is really bad because I'm in different time zones all the time, and you get used to one spot. You know, my brother in law, he made a funny joke. He told me I was like a tomato plant that kept getting dug up and replanted and dug up and replanted. So my plant looks good, but I'm not going to make any tomatoes that way, right? So he compares me to that, and I'm like, well, that's a good point. You know, I don't have any children yet. I I am always gone. Um, I just got married at age 45. I'm 47 now. And um, so, yeah, it's it's there's there's pluses and minuses to everything. How old's your wife? 29. She's okay, okay. I yeah, love yeah, this she's guy. Got she's got time. <laughs> hey, so <laughs> you're a big dude. You, you, Fitness is a part of what you do, obviously. You're yeah. carrying rigs around, right? I mean, yeah. is that, you You have to be, you have to be fit. I, I mean, you have to be. It, it, it helps for sure because, my gosh, you don't want to be uh, out, out of shape. I mean, you probably won't ever be as in shape as you'd like to be out on the road, especially if you're going someplace like, If you have to climb Mount Everest or something like that, like those Sherpas are always going to be like in way better shape than you. Hats off to those Sherpas that do that stuff all the time because like they're running around in flip flops carrying everybody's gear. And then they they summit that big mountains like that all the time. And you're like just barely making it there with an oxygen tank on and raising your thumb up before they have to force you off the mountain because you – you know, it's just not in your blood. But yeah, you it helps to be in shape. It also helps to be in shape if you want to get this kind of work too, because, you know, people that are hiring people, they kind of j- make their judgments when you come in and sit down for the interview. They want to know what you've done. So, you know, if you've got, if you're in shape, it helps. If Glenn and I walk in for the same job, <laughs> I would hire you. I would hire you. <laughs> Have you done Everest? Have you? No, oh. no, I haven't done Everest. No. Are you a climber though? Uh, you seem like you're adventure all over. I haven't done a lot of high mountain out. I've okay. worked definitely worked in the mountains. Like in in on edge of Alaska, we were in um, the Wrangell Mountains, and we were working with an abandoned copper mine. Right. And we were camped at the base of this mine at one time, and you had to. We would be flown up by helicopter and then we have to climb up to the entrance of the mine which is a little precarious we had this crazy avalanche that almost took our camp out there was actually nine avalanches during that time and it got within maybe 20 feet of our our camp and then they the insurance company got all excited because oh you know look what happened and they came and got us the next day and then from then on we weren't allowed to camp there we had to just be flown up every day oh my god do you um I'm. I love food. Are, do, are you a foodie when you're on the road? Oh, absolutely. I think we all like anytime. Do you if, have time to go out? Oh and yeah. At, oh yeah. After oh the shoot. sure. And then a lot of times too, like so everywhere we go, there's a company of locals that take us oh, everywhere. Right. So they know everything. Like, oh, you must try this. Isn't that great though? Oh, Isn't it's that amazing. An awesome it's thing? it's so because I think food. I mean, just to see things, but to taste food, that's 
experiencing culture right there because right. that that is just generations and generations of people living in that area and and surviving famines and then this dish comes out of this crazy famine you know or we eat this here you know like i love thai food i love indian food you know you know when you have a kid and you're able to bring him with you to these different countries and to see their face and to see them experiencing that for the first time it is so amazing you're gonna have such a great time i'm excited it's Son, yeah. this is cat man do. <laughs> I mean, I they love it. They and the oh, kids that's are awesome. Love everything. Yeah. I mean, that's great. So you're you, you you've been married two years. You yeah. dated her for a while before that. Yeah. But as a single guy in all these countries back in the day, it must have been wild. It was. There was. <laughs> I had some wild adventures. Yeah, I did. I mean, of course, everybody. Uh, you know, when you travel around, you know you. You're spending a lot of time someplace. Yeah, there's a, and there's a nice that looking white man comes. Human part. Oh, well, thank big you very dude, much. camera, <laughs> yeah. big rig. Exactly. If you know what I mean. Yeah, there's there was some crazy crazy times. You know, I I don't regret being married though. I love I love what marriage is all about and what it brings and how I feel. But yeah, I mean, um, you know, you're going to shoot uh, Mayan ruins in Mexico. You're going to be a, in Cancun for a while. You know. Uh, Come on, let's get gonna... more exotic. I've been to Cancun. <laughs> Come on. He wasn't doing anything in Nepal. No, I'm no, no, him. not in Nepal, no. But, uh, you know, yeah, you meet people and things happen and you're on the road. And and like you said, you know, you are you don't have a relationship. And if you do have one, you try really hard to keep it. But, you know, the, the opposites happen to me, too, where I've been in a relationship. I'm gone for a number of months and then I come home and they're gone. They're like, I want a, I want a man that's going to stay around, you know. Mm. I can't, I can't sit here and wait for you. Or they, they're worried about what you're doing, and it's like, no, 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 uh, you know. And then, you know, so people leave too, you know. Fifty-seven countries. So I'm just let me get back to this. Everybody has an address book, right? Oh, well, if, when I go to New York, I'm, I'm from New York. I'm going to call my buddies, or I know people in Chicago. Are you like, oh, I'm going to be in South Africa? I'm going to call. Bill, like, are you are you that guy? Oh. Like, you have a whole Rolodex of a million na- Rolodex. That's in the old days, team. We used to write it down. <laughs> He's but flip you know what I'm saying? Like, you, you're Absolutely. that guy. Absolutely, yeah. I because I I stay in touch with all the fixers. We call them fixers. Right. They're the they're the like the local producer in whatever country you're in. And then uh, you you know you work with them. You get close with them, and uh, a friendship develops. Also, a business relationship develops. Like, I don't know how many times I've hooked productions that I'm not even on. Uh, I've made the referral to like people in Thailand, people in other places. Uh, oh, we worked with this great person that knew everything about what we were doing. And, and so nine times out of 10, they'll just call that person. And of course it works out because it's easy and it saves the production company a lot of time. So I do have a quite extensive Rolodex of, uh, people all over the world that work in film and television and also their friends too. So you go and visit them and say hi and all that stuff. So Do you have a Sherpa? Good. Do you have a Sherpa? I used it? to. Uh, my Sherpa was named Micah. He was my assistant cameraman. Okay. Uh, really great. But, you know, Micah or just like most ACs in my business, they hang out long enough. They go off to be camera people themselves. So, You know, we have a, a segment called 15 Seconds of Fame where – our audience can find you on a clip, perhaps. Maybe you got on a show. Oh Did goodness. you get captured on camera? Darting a rhino. Exactly, that we can find somewhere on the Let internet. Think about this. Uh, I, if you look on very old footage of Jeff Corwin, uh, a big red-faced monkey in the Amazon jumps on my head while I'm filming Jeff. <laughs> You can see my shoulder inside of my face with a big red-faced monkey on it. What year was this? 2001. It was a long time. And that monkey's in his It was book. the Amazon Jeff Corwin experience. Okay. okay. I, I don't get captured quite a bit. I'm jealous. You know who gets on, on TV all the time? The sound guys do. Sound guys. Yes. Running sound away. Sound guys get on TV all the time. Uh, assistant cameras get on TV. Producers get on TV all the time. I never get on TV. Because you're shooting. I'm always the one having to pan the camera and, sh- and film. What, what, where are you off to next? Uh, we're getting ready just to leave for Ocean Treks now. It's a show on ABC on Saturday mornings. Mm-hmm. We're going to start off in Catalina, go to Alaska. Where, you mean Jeff? You and Jeff, Jeff, Corwin. Jeff Corwin. Yeah, my old friend. Uh, we're going to go to Catalina and Alaska first, but then we're off to Bermuda and the Bahamas, and then after that, Norway, Germany, and St. Petersburg, Russia, and then on to Japan, I think. That is fantastic. Well, Come we want <laughs> we want to thank Glenn for coming on our thank show. You, We've this learned is so much. Me. I want to look at your black book. <laughs> 
Thanks a lot, man. You got yeah. it. Be Thank safe you. out there. All right. Such a pleasure.